Thank you very much for joining this webinar about, uh, Q, about payment QR codes. My name is Jean Cany. I'm the Vice President of Enterprise Retail at Sitcom. I'm French, as you can probably hear, and I'm based in New Jersey. So let's go directly into the topic. So Sitcom is the most trusted QR payment provider in North America, already providing QR wallet acceptance capabilities to thousands of merchants who wanted to accept Venmo PayPal, WeChat Pay, Alipay, Union Pay, installment wallets, uh, crypto wallets, and other mobile wallets in their stores, on their websites, or for remote payments, for example. By working with so many merchants across so many different verticals, we found out that it was really hard for the merchants to find sources of information. So we decided to make this kind of a crash course on QR payments uh, to give you the basic knowledge to talk about it with any QR payment provider, and not just Sitcon, and compare the different technologies based on your needs. Why do we think we know enough about QR payments to make this webinar? It's because 85% of the transactions for WeChat Pay and Alipay in the US go through Sitcon, and 40% of the merchants who launched Venmo and PayPal QR payments chose Sitcon. We started QR payments in 2015 when nobody was even thinking this could become a reality one day. Everyone was focused on NFC and ENV at the time. So the goal of this webinar is not to make you an expert on all QR technology, as there are so many to cover. The goal today is simply to lay down some of the basic principles used in QR payments. We want to first define the different terms that you may hear, as there are many ways to describe the same thing, or sometimes people use the same word to describe different technologies. Let's make sure we all speak the same language first, or at least that you will be able to become the official translator in your organization when it comes to QR payments. Then we will talk about the different UX, the user experience. We will look at it from different angles, the consumer angle, the store associate angle, and we will briefly mention the finance and the IT angle at the end. Although this would be probably a topic uh, that would require another webinar in the future uh, for our finance and IT. We will try to provide some advices based on the different types of business, such as QSR, retail, luxury, and some others. During this webinar, if you have any question, please write them in the chat room and we will try to answer them, uh, answer as many as possible before the end of the webinar. For the questions that cannot be answered right away, we will write them down and we can send an answer to the people who completed our contact form on uh, sitcom.com slash contact. Let's start with some definitions. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. First of all, what does QR mean? Uh, QR stands for quick response. A quick, uh, sorry, a quick response code is basically a much more advanced version of a barcode if you want. Then why not simply using a barcode? Because QR codes can store much more data than the barcode. A basic UPC barcode may be also limited in length. But with QR code, you can embed much more. It's often used to embed a URL, but it can be used to generate a one-time use token uh, of your user account, or it can even be used to embed a story. So let's look at this story here. <laughs> this is not definitely not a typical use of QR codes. I just took that example to kind of compare barcodes and, uh, and QR. No humans can read uh, um, such story within that QR code, obviously. We, can, we cannot really embed an entire novel in a QR code either, but this is just to show you an example uh, to compare both barcode and QR codes. So on the left side, there's a random text from a blogger. Then I try to translate this text into a barcode. As you can see on the top right corner, translating only the first sentence already generates a very long barcode. 
You can see it right here. It's probably a little bit small, but that's only the first sentence here. Uh, I estimated that if I were to translate the whole story and print it on a paper with enough resolution so that a scanner could scan it, the barcode sticker would probably be five to 10 feet long. On the bottom right corner right here, uh, you can see the entire story fitting into a QR code. Obviously, you cannot print that on a half inch sticker unless you have a very, very high performance printer. But this QR code will be fine if printing on a three to four inch sticker, for example. Still big, but much better than a 10 feet long sticker. Wouldn't you agree? Generally speaking, when it comes to payment QR codes, it does not get that complex. Here are some examples of QR codes that are used for payments. On the top row, you can see uh, different QR codes generated by different wallets. The Venmo and PayPal QR codes are usually limited to 12 digits, making it a very simple QR code to scan. Uh, those are actually example that I put here. I realize they're actually probably uh, uh, more complicated than 12 digit, but the actual one in, in production is, is much, uh, much uh, more simple. The Alipay QR code is usually between 18 and 24 digit long. And the second one uh, in red is um, a Union Pay QR code. They use some ENV standard uh, that makes the QR code content much longer, usually around 120 letters, numbers, and it also includes special characters. The WeChat Pay QR code is usually 18 digit long. So you can see different standards, obviously, uh, with, with different complexity of QR, but everything is really fine on, on a screen on, the, on a smartphone. With a rapid growth of QR payment all over the world, we can foresee that those QR, QR codes will evolve and become more complicated and long. Uh, there are some reasons behind, but that's uh, uh, really the more people use it, then the more numbers you need to have to uh, ensure having a unique QR code. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion around the kind of the bin range of those QR payment that allows to recognize if that's an Alipay or a Venmo QR code, for example. Uh, but yeah, this is a completely different topic and uh, very interesting though, uh, and very, very fun to, to look at uh, from, from, uh, uh, from our angle. And we actually even give some advice sometimes to some wallets who may not even think about that because they're only thinking about their own wallet and they don't realize other, that there might be conflict with other wallets. Um, and that could be a reason for, for a wallet not to be enabled in a store, uh, for example. One thing that few people know is that QR codes also include some data, allowing QR payments provider to recognize what QR wallet is being scanned by the merchant. So that's a bin that I was uh, talking about. However, we've seen that most providers did not necessarily include that in their product. So that could lead to a very poor UX on the store associate side and for finance reconciliation. We'll come back to this later. On the lower row, uh, we put some QR codes generated by merchants to accept payments from their customers. Um, sorry, on the right side, I meant. Um, you can see first the static QR code. Those are uh, pretty simple as they just send the user to a fixed URL. Unless the URL is very long and complicated, which is rare, the static QR code should be pretty basic. However, when we get into the dynamic QR code generated on the payment terminal, those can sometimes become quickly complicated. You can see on the second picture, a very complicated QR code that probably works on that device, but may, may not work on other devices where the screen resolution is lower. Another issue you can see on the, the, the bottom right image is the light that can disrupt the scanning of that QR by the customer. You may think that customer will have the same issue, but they won't because usually the wallet app would increase the screen brightness to its maximum when you generate a payment QR code. So depending on your payment provider and how much they know and understand about QR payments, but also how much they're willing to invest uh, on that QR payment technology, and the actual UX in a store, you may or may not end up with a good solution. We'll come back to the pros and cons of the different solution later. So we mentioned static QR and dynamic QR. Let's start with the most basic QR, the static QR code. The static QR code is a QR code that cannot be changed once produced. 
it has a fixed destination URL. The code that is being embedded is hard coded and cannot be altered. You might have seen static QR codes at your daycares to sign in your child or to access a website, for example. You may even have seen in some small businesses a static QR code that can be used for payment. When they are used for payment, static QR codes are usually leading the customer to a P2P payment, uh, just as you would do for a Venmo payment to your friend or to an online website allowing you to place an online order for your lunch and drink, for example. The most common use of static QR after the pandemic of COVID-19 started uh, was having a QR code on the table in a restaurant, allowing you to see the menu and place your order directly within that web page. However, you will probably never see a static QR code used for direct payment in an enterprise company. Why is that? Because static QR are easy to fraud. So let's do a quick fraud training on static QR codes. Uh, let's look at this video and let's see how static QR code have been used to steal money from merchants in China, for example. This is a very common uh, uh, fraud. So you can see here, that's it. Let me probably go back again. So that person is basically sticking a QR code on top of the merchant's QR code. So let me pause here. As a froster, you can easily generate and print your own QR code. You stick it on the top of the merchant's QR. And now imagine a merchant using the Venmo static QR code to accept payments, for example. Outside of the poor UX, right, and the potential human errors of the consumers paying with a wrong amount, I could come into the store. And as soon as the store associate or store manager turned their back on me, I would just swap their QR code to my personal Venmo QR code. All the money paid to that merchant would be paid to me instead. And the merchant would be liable for that, right? Because that's, that's their mistake to not check their static QR code. That's why we would never recommend that to an enterprise account. The risk is probably low for an individual selling at a farmer's market, since that person would not be the uh, main target for fraud but there is always risks. Another risk with static QR code is by hackers. They don't necessarily want your money. They want access your phone. So they can change a static QR and send the consumer to a URL where they would download a virus, potentially giving access to my phone to a hacker with bad intent. Then as a merchant, I'm not only risking losing some money for that particular transaction, I may lose all my customers once this makes the evening news that thousands of customers at your store got hacked due to a malicious static QR code. So long story short, um, don't use static QR codes if you can avoid that. And if you do, uh, you need to implement procedures with regular check uh, of your static QR in your stores or restaurants. Uh, there are actually some static QR solutions on the market uh, with actually some of uh, Sitcon partner that are much more secure uh, and they, they can be recommended, very easy to implement. Uh, but most of the static QR code solutions are, are really, really risky. So I know what you're thinking, you're probably thinking, Jean, I thought QR payment were really secure, way more secure than car transactions. And you're right, QR payments are highly secure, but not static QR. What is secure is actually the use of dynamic QR codes. So what's a dynamic QR code? A dynamic QR is a QR that is changing regularly based on certain patterns. For example, Alipay or WeChat Pay QR codes change automatically after 60 seconds or after being used for a payment. This is a security feature preventing someone to take a picture of my QR code and use it later uh, to buy something. Let me ask you a question. In Venmo or WeChat, you can generate both a static QR and a dynamic QR. Why is that? The static QR is the contact QR used to add a friend. It's more or less your digital ID card or your V card uh, that you give to people to add you as a friend. Your contact QR usually never changes. In China, it's very common for businessmen to print their WeChat contact QR code on the business cards uh, 
you know, that very, very uh, a common use. So if you, if you fly to China, uh, you know, in the, in the future and you see QR codes, that's probably their WeChat uh, contact. The dynamic QR will be used, however, as a payment QR code for security purpose. Uh, if you send a screenshot to someone, that screenshot would be useless unless the whole send, receive, display, buy, scan process takes less than 60 seconds. In addition, most apps won't allow you to screenshot your QR code uh, or they will expire the QR code as soon as you share that screenshot. That's actually the case on, on uh, Alipay. You can, uh, you, can, you can screenshot it, but as soon as you share it, then, then it expires. It's a pretty cool feature. Now with that said, different wallets could use different patterns, expiring the QR code after only 30 seconds or on the contrary, after three minutes, or they could remove the time expiring feature and only expire a QR code when a transaction is made only. Each wallet creates those rules, right? So it's not uh, Sitcon or you know, the payment provider who creates those rules, it's the, the wallet themselves. They control um, what's happening on that app. That's for the consumer side, right? So I know we already talked a lot, a lot about QR code. I probably mentioned QR uh, more than 50 times since the beginning of the webinar. Uh, so remember, on the QR side, on the customer side, uh, when they want to pay with QR code, uh, they'll use uh, dynamic QR code. I often recommend people actually to test the Starbucks or the Dunkin' Donut app and pay with their QR option. You can actually consider Starbucks and Dunkin' as QR wallets, similar to Venmo or Alipay, uh, but they are restricted for payments within that particular brand. You cannot use uh, the Starbucks app to buy something, I don't know, at your supermarket, for example. You can only buy a Starbucks coffee uh, with a Starbucks app. Now, what does dynamic QR mean for a merchant trying to accept QR payments? I showed you a few minutes ago some screenshots of dynamic QR codes used for payment in a store, remember? Merchants do not control the consumer's wallet, which is what, it, uh, what I showed on my previous slide. So when would a merchant generate a dynamic QR code? Typically for merchant show QR transaction or for an e-commerce transaction. Basically in situations where the merchant is not able to scan the consumer QR code. In that case, the merchant needs to generate a QR code and it's the, cons the consumer who comes and scans it instead. That QR code generated by the merchant, either on their website or on their store payment terminal, for example, needs to be dynamic since it would include different information such as the store ID, the amount, the currency, some other information specific to this uh, transaction. So now that we understand what is a QR code and the differences between static and dynamic QR codes, let's jump into the user experience that they provide. Uh, first of all, you will notice that different companies will use different terms. Some companies work for the merchant and take the angle of the merchant. Some companies work for their users, and I mean by that the consumers, and will take the point of view of the customer. So let's start with the most common case and best user experience really for QR payments, what I call the merchant scan QR user experience. Merchant scan QR is when the merchant is scanning the customer's QR code, right? Uh, customer present QR is when the customer generates a QR code on their phone and show it to the merchant so that the merchant can scan it. Wait a second, isn't that the same? Yes, you're right. They are both the same. So merchant scan QR or customer present QR are the same thing, just different angle. One is from the merchant angle, one is from the consumer angle. Uh, at Sitcon, for instance, we mostly use merchant scan QR because we work with the merchants. So when we explain that to the merchant, we tell them it's a merchant scan QR so they understand they have to scan the QR code of the customer. Uh, PayPal, for example, on the other hand, as a wallet, they think about the PayPal users first, since 
they are what makes PayPal successful. And therefore they use customer present QR. Same thing, just a different angle. Now let's look at the other UX, which is when the merchant generates the QR code. In this case, you will hear merchant show QR, since the merchant is showing a QR code uh, to the customer and asking the customer to scan it to pay. You might also hear the other angle uh, with the term customer scan. However, this term customer scan, I personally don't like it. This term can be very confusing since a customer could be scanning a dynamic QR code, a static QR code used for a P2P payment or a static QR code used for online ordering via a web page. So generally speaking, uh, I feel it's safer as a merchant to use a merchant's angle when talking about QR payment technologies. So hopefully I have not lost anyone yet on who is scanning what, and I really hope that none of you will dream about QR codes tonight. Uh, if you do, then you can, uh, you can complain to, to Jamie. Uh, so in reality, what does all this mean? What does it mean for me as a merchant to accept QR payments via merchant scan QR? Let me show you some uh, simple use case. And the most common one, especially in retail, is to leverage your barcode scanner. What did you say barcode scanner? I thought we were chatting about QR codes, Jean. Well, the scanner that you use to scan your barcodes to identify an item in your POS can also be used to scan QR codes with one requirement. It has to be a 2D scanner to be able to read screens. A 1D scanner will usually only read paper, which obviously would not work to scan your customer's phone. Uh, good thing is that nowadays it's pretty hard to actually buy a 1D scanner. So unless your scanners are really old, you're very likely to be able to scan QR codes today already with no extra hardware. Another way is to use any camera you have. Uh, some of you may be using a point of sale software running on an iPad or a Windows tablet. Those are equipped with uh, cameras by default. You can actually use that camera instead of your SKU scanner. What are the advantages of using your scanner or your tablet camera? This allows you to keep full flexibility to pick the hardware you want for card payments. That could mean that if you need to change your card payment terminal for any reason, and let's just hope there is no new EMV project coming soon, you would be able to pick anything you want without worrying about the terminal that can accept QR payments. Uh, more capabilities on a payment terminal would also mean higher cost usually, which can be avoided when you simply use a hardware that you already have and will never get rid of anyway. And that's the barcode scanner. One last thing, but it's really important for a successful launch of QR payments in your store, is the ability for your store associates to use what they use every single day to scan other things. Based on our experience, store associates know immediately how to process a QR payment when it leverages the SKU scanner. So that's also good saving uh, you know, for the operations team uh, and the retail team. One of the shortcomings of this method is the fact that it's not adapted to a pay at the table type of environment, since you would not bring the whole register with you <laughs> to a table. Um, however, this shortcoming is gone if you're a restaurant with an MPOS and the waiter carries that tablet with them everywhere and use a tablet's camera instead. That is also the fastest way to process a transaction. It would usually take between one and three seconds to be processed compared to a merchant show QR transaction that will usually take 20 to 60 seconds to be processed. A third way is in the case of a merchant using a mobile smart terminal, such as a PAX A920, a Cloverflex, a point terminal, a Deja Vu, a QD terminal, or any other mobile payment terminal. You can also use that camera, but you may have other limitations depending on what software is running on it. The advantages are the fact that those smart terminals can leave the register, can travel in the store, uh, potentially even grab an order uh, to get the total amount, 
and you can even bring them outside of the store uh, for curbside payment. It's really convenient if you need capabilities for curbside payment, pay at the table, VIP payment outside of your store. Spark terminals can also embed uh, point of sale software functions, although they might be limited compared to enterprise point of sale softwares, making it an all in one solution for small business without complex inventory reporting ERP requirements. Uh, it's not free of shortcomings, however. Right? The first issue is that those smart terminals are pricey, although this is debatable nowadays compared to most pin pads used for a cart. Uh, store associates do not always know there is a camera on those devices and may not know they need to use it to scan the customer's QR code. Uh, this requires training, but we foresee this issue to disappear in the future as these actions become daily routine for everyone in any store now. If you need to change your payment terminal, you will have complex requirements for your new uh, terminal instead of having a simple car payment requirement versus a SKU scanner bypassing option that we mentioned earlier. Now, ideally, your implementation allows everything. And this is something we've done with multiple merchants who work with us. Don't limit yourself to one payment touch point. Your customer wants to be able to make a transaction anywhere. So don't limit yourself to accept QR payment in only one way. Think about all your touch points and how you can accept any type of payment at any touch point. You want to be able to use your barcode scanner, the camera on your MPOS if you have one, and the camera uh, on your other payment terminal. How about merchant show QR? It's usually displayed on a merchant pin pad. It can also be displayed on the customer facing screen, depending on the point of sale used. Uh, recently, I forgot where, where I was eating, but uh, I remember it was a, a Revel point of sale uh, and there was this uh, customer facing screen. So you could actually generate um, a QR code directly on that screen and, and still bypass that payment terminal. So keep in mind how you generate the QR code on the pin pad will have different impact on store associate user experience as well as customer user experience. So two things, right? It's not just about the customer, it's also about your store associate. Let's talk about the most common user experience, which is the merchant displaying a QR code on the card pin pad. And let's think about how this could impact your store associate UX as well as your customer UX. To do that, we're gonna to have to think about what happened on the point of sale first. The first option is to have the store associate just following the same procedure as usual, sending the request for payment to the pin pad. The pin pad turns on the card reader, the NFC reader, but also displays on the pin pad the option to select other payment option. So up to here, nothing different for your store associate. Training is, training is very easy, which is great. Now, what you're actually doing is asking the customer how they wanna pay. So they can insert their card, they can pay with NFC, or they will see on the pin pad some other options they can select. At that point, the customer needs to click on the QR wallet they wanna use, wait for the pin pad to display a QR code, then they will use their wallet app on their phone to scan that QR code. They will validate the payment, payment will be processed, and the pin pad will send information back to the point of sale and the transaction uh, that the transaction was successful. What are the advantages uh, of this method? All payments are still going through the pin pad. Training for store associate looks simple. However, let's look at the shortcomings. First of all, the transaction speed is incredibly slower you face potential decline if the customer's connection also on their phone is not strong enough. Their you know, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi connection. So think about it in a mall when you're in the basement of the mall uh, at the food court where nobody is getting any, any type of reception. It also, it's also poor customer UX because a customer will usually tell store associate that they want to pay with QR codes before the pin pad is enabled. Without indication from the store associate, they will pull their card first 
and they will find out that they can pay differently only after that. Usually consumers don't bother changing their card for their phone when the card is out. Uh, maybe unless they have like a strong promotion or something, obviously. And that touches the store associate training because the store associate won't have the standard on their point of sale. They will most likely not even know they accept those QR wallets. In the real world, customer ask right away, do you accept Alipay, for example? Then if the store associate does not know the answer, the customer may actually just leave the store. So that, that's potentially losing a sale. Now, another shortcoming, and in my opinion, it's the biggest one, is in case of multiple QR payment option. The pin pad becomes unreadable. Imagine putting multiple logos on your pin pad for a Venmo, PayPal, Alipay, Alipay Hong Kong, WeChat Pay, Union Pay QR, Klarna, Affirm, Cacao Pay, uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum. I mean, that's going to be very uh, crowded on that pin pad. Some providers will use the argument. I heard that actually uh, at a conference a couple of months ago. Uh, so they'll make the argument that a merchant should only select the payment methods that make the most sense to them. Yeah, of course they have to do that because otherwise they have, you know, they never get a payment through through that uh, pin pad because it would be unreadable. But for some brands, some brands are just global brands with consumers from all over the world. And so that's gonna become problematic. More than four logos on a pin pad will basically make it unreadable. Today, most retailers already want more than four wallets. Most of the retailers we work with, they already have five or more wallets enabled. So that, that's, that's not a, a very scalable option. That's uh, actually the, the flow chart, right? So that's what I was kind of describing. Maybe let me try to go quickly through it. I mean, there are like so many different flow charts. We've got, uh, I don't know, 30 different flow charts probably for different type of uh, uh, user experience. But this is just uh, one where, you know, the store associate here, click on the tender, which is just a checkout tender that sends a request to the gateway. Uh, the gateway enables the, the pin pad. Then the customer selects, uh, let's say Alipay in this case, that was just the exa example I took. Then the gateway says, okay, I need an Alipay QR code, right? Then it contacts Sitcon. Sitcon send the gateway, uh, display that QR code on the pin pad. Then the customer will go and scan that QR code and then the transaction will happen. The rest is kind of uh, simple. Uh, so, but that's not the only way. There are also other ways. So. Uh, it can get a little bit complicated and just look at this. Uh, I think that looks like an Ingenico pin pad. Uh, if you start adding more and more logos, that's going to be really hard to read. Um, so let me see. Sorry about that. So on the, the option two is when the store associate selects the QR payment tender. The advantage is obviously, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, one second, I need to read a, to drink a little bit of water. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, so yeah, so let me go back to here. So uh, the second option uh, with a merchant show QR is to have the store associate select the QR payment tender. Uh, the advantage is that the store associate will know they accept the QR payment. I remember in the case earlier, we said the, the store associate may not even know they accept QR payments because you know they never need to see that. So they can offer proactively different payment options to the customer. Customer does not need to make the selection themselves, uh, which nowadays you need to think in a world where people don't want to touch pin pads that actually becomes quite important. Uh, there is no crowded pin pad screen with multiple wallets. Uh, it's a pretty good UX for stores or restaurants that have a customer facing screen that can be used instead of the pin pad. The shortcomings, you know, transaction speed is still much slower and there is still a potential decline if the customer's connection is not strong enough. All right, so that's the, the difference. So you can see actually uh, this one and that one are very different. This one, this flowchart here is much more simple. Now it's got good and bad also. Uh, actually, this one would be 
uh, actually very uh, heavy on bandwidth requirements, et cetera. So overall, right, the show QR uh, solution, uh, it's, it, I would say it's not, it's not the best for, for QR payments, unless that's the only option you have. But if you have the other option to scan as a merchant, the customer's co uh, QR code, that's probably the option you want to go with. Um, all right, so let's do a quick, uh, a quick summary of uh, part two. So we talked about merchant scan QR using your barcode scanner, your tablet's camera, or your smart terminal camera. We also talked about merchant show QR using your pin pad. Uh, now that we understand the most common UX that are used for a QR payment, let's talk briefly about finance and IT. And I hope none of you are, uh, have fallen asleep uh, before <laughs> until now, uh, but I promise you I'm almost done. The, the nightmare in my Osmo almost, uh, almost uh, is gonna end very soon. Uh, so let's talk briefly about finance first, right? After all, finance is gonna have to reconcile those transactions every day. And IT is the one who is going to implement all these different wallets. This could actually be the topic of another webinar, to be honest, but I'm gonna give you some ideas of what you should consider when you select your payment providers, being Sitcon or someone else. Let's look at finance first. You have two things to reconcile, sales audit and funding, right, to the bank account. So here is what's gonna have a big impact for you. The number of tenders on the store point of sale and the number of funding sources you have. Some wallet won't allow you to connect to them directly, such as uh, WeChat Pay or Union Pay and some others. Some wallets will give you the choice to get your funding from them directly. This usually sounds good because you think you can get better deals if you connect to the wallet directly. In reality, that's not how it works, simply because it does not follow the same standard rules of Visa or MasterCard with fixed interchange fee. And you certainly do not want to end up with 10 different funding sources to reconcile every day. What you want to do is really combine all the funding of all these wallets into one funding source. Then in order to do that, you also need to make sure you only have one tender on the point of sale so that matching sales transaction and your bank statement will be extremely simple. The unique QR tender on the point of sale is also very important because you don't want to have one tender for each wallet. And think about the store associate who would probably need to be a PhD in QR payments to remember all these different wallets. For your card payments, you only have one tender called cards. Do the same for QR payments. Basically, one tender, one reconciliation, one settlement. On the fees, something that merchants don't realize is that by combining multiple wallets, they can get better rates on them. For instance, at Sitcon, we do not charge any fee for Venmo PayPal. That means you can get your funds from PayPal or from Sitcon, you would pay the same transaction fees. Let's take the Chinese QR payments as another example. You could connect to Alipay directly Assuming that you have Chinese developers and a Chinese speaking support team in your treasury team, uh, or you could use a provider like Sitcon, but there are some other in different countries too, uh, who will combine all these for you. And by scaling up your payment volume, you're reducing your cost of acceptance. Now, do you want to combine everything, including your card payments under the same provider? That's very tempting but usually car processor only provide one or two options for QR payments, whereas a specialist of QR payments uh, will provide you with dozens of options, allowing you to provide the best experience to your customers without making your reconciliation a major burden. On the IT side, imagine if you get a request to connect to 10 different wallets, that's gonna take all your resources for a few years. What you want is a simple implementation that allows you to get all the wallets together and that allows you to scale in the future. And you also don't want to have to maintain direct, uh, multiple direct integration. You just want something that it, you do it once and then you'd never have to touch it again. 
don't settle for a merchant show QR with two wallets on your pin pad when you know you're going to have to give this up soon when you need to implement 10 wallets. Look at the long term or even just the midterm and not just at providing something today that you can keep using tomorrow. To give you an example, we had a customer who had launched uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, and UnionPay QR code with us in the past. They were using a fully integrated solution, leveraging their barcode scanner to process a merchant scan QR type of transaction. One day, they came to me and said, uh, Jean, we want to accept Venmo and PayPal too. The only thing we did was to onboard them in our system, turn those new payment options for them, and immediately all their stores were, were, went live with Venmo and PayPal. So the scalability of the solution you implement would impact your future resources. We're at the end of this webinar, which I hope you found useful. I will now take some of your questions and try to answer them. Uh, for the question that remain unanswered, I will write them down and uh, answer them by email. Feel free also to visit our contact webpage on uh, www.sitcount.com slash contact and leave your contact information and I will send you the answers that you need. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, a few questions here. So first off, what are the trans transaction costs of QR codes uh, payments versus traditional card payments? So it depends really on the, uh, the wallets, obviously. Uh, generally speaking, that's gonna cost less than credit card transaction. If you look at uh, Chinese uh, wallet, for example, uh, especially in the US, right? Each country can be a little bit different, but in the US, uh, Chinese wallet are way cheaper than a union pay card transaction that goes through the um, Discover network, for example. Uh, so, so that's one thing. On Venmo PayPal, uh, it's the, the difference is not as obvious. Uh, although like usually, you know, people who would pay with Venmo and PayPal would probably be people who would pay actually with a credit card. Uh, so that those, you know, if you compare actually to credit cards, it's going to be usually cheaper. If you compare it to debit cards, it'll probably be more expensive, but those are usually not uh, competing. There is no cannibalization uh, from, from your debit card users or, or even cash users. Uh, so different wallets, right, will have different, uh, different prices. Uh, generally speaking, right, the pricing is very simple. It's a flat fee. So there's not, it's not like Visa or MasterCard where you will have uh, interchange plus a processing fee and uh, with QR, QR payments, it's very simple. It's really just a flat fee, flat percent plus, you know, X amount of cents uh, per transaction. Uh, maybe in some cases, there might be more for uh, the technology being used. There might be some monthly fees, but that's, that's not really related to the, to the uh, processing itself. Great. Uh, these two questions are kind of related. Uh, one was, how long does it take to integrate QR payments into an existing POS system? And then also, uh, for a merchant new to QR payments, what development setup costs would they incur? I'd say it really depends. Uh, most of the time, actually, there's no, no, no fees, actually, no, no development costs. Uh, most of the, like, at least in our case, we've done so many different integrations, right? So let's say uh, a merchant is using uh, um, XStore, right? Or Toshiba uh, as a point of sale. We already did the integration, right? So there's no, there's no other fees. The fees that the merchant could incur would probably be an implementation fee uh, from the point of sale or the integrator. Uh, they, they work with. Uh, in some cases, there is no fee at all, you know, with uh, Sejid, for example, which is a, a, a French point of sale. Um, there's no, there is no implementation fee from, from Sejid. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's just purely installing it and uh, uh, going live very quickly. So it really, really depends on the development. Now, if there is no existing integration into the point of sale, uh, that's when, you know, we, you know, we need to start <laughs> somewhere. Uh, so that, that's when there could be some fees, uh, but most of the point of sale are actually quite excited about adding those QR payment options because uh, they do get the request. So uh, I've, I've seen I've seen many cases where they may not even charge anything at all. Um, overall, right, there are a lot of different options uh, compared to any card project, uh, like the, the scale and the kind of the cost that could be 
associated are way lower with QR payments. Again, because it's just everything is just much more simple. Those transactions are just very, uh, very easy and simple. Yeah. Yeah. And, and earlier you had shown a slide about this, I think, but um, th this question may have prefaced that. Um, do store associates need to be able to recognize what wallet the QR code came from when it's presented? So that's, I think that's one of the issue that we, uh, we solve, you know, but not every company does. Uh, so, so some QR, some providers, they just choose a simple way, right? They make their life easy. Uh, they make their, their dev team having a, a simple work, uh, but that's going to have impact on the store associate, which indeed will need to, to recognize the wallet. So I, I've seen some cases, right, where, where basically the, the store associate had to know what was the difference between WeChat and Alipay. So uh, think about, I don't know, like uh, let's take someone in Arkansas. Uh, they probably not have many people who are bilingual in Chinese and you who can read Chinese and, and speak Chinese in Arkansas. I'm sure they are, but probably less than in uh, California, for example. So what happens if, a, you know, a Chinese person comes and show, show a QR code and they cannot com com communicate? If the store associate choose the wrong uh, wallet because they're just like, hey, it's either WeChat or Alipay or Union Pay QR. Well, so they have 67% chance to choose the wrong one. Uh, and that's why they get a lot of declines. So that's why it's very important to really uh, not compromise on that because that's gonna impact your, your sales and, and your revenue. So what you want is really having uh, something easy for the store associate. So you should have one tender which is called QR payments, and they don't need to know if that QR payment, uh, that sorry, that QR code is a Venmo uh, QR, is an Alipay QR, is a WeChat QR, is a Klarna QR. They don't need to know all that. They sh store associates should be trained to sell. They should not be trained to, you know, write a master thesis on uh, QR payments and QR wallets. Right. And and actually, a separate related question there was. Um, well, maybe it's not terribly related, but uh, so when you're comparing QR codes to um, other forms of transaction, what are the security implications? Like, are there uh, advantages, disadvantages to one versus another? Yeah, so I, I mentioned a little bit about the, the risk right with static QR. So I think those, those I, I mentioned. So yeah, static QR is definitely not ideal. Uh, unless, unless the provider is very good and very professional and has those security uh, enhancements. Now, I'm going to stick to dynamic QRs, which is really what is being used for QR payments, um, where the customer you know, displays a, a dynamic QR code that is changing on their phone, or it could be also the, the merchant that is uh, generating a, a QR code on their screen or pin pad. Uh, because it's dynamic, it's very safe. Uh, in a QR payment transaction, there is no PII uh, information. That QR is just a token of that uh, account holder. Uh, so even if you are able to capture that token, there's nothing you can do with it, right? Because uh, after 60 seconds or after payment, that's it, it just expires and you cannot do anything with it. So it's, uh, it is very, very secure. Uh, you know, some people will say, well, what if someone steals my phone? Uh, yeah, you're right. What if someone steals your credit card? If someone steals your credit card, they go to a mall, they, they buy Chanel and Hermes and Gucci, uh, and uh, they're very happy. <laughs> and then you have a lot of chargebacks. With, uh, if you drop your phone, well, uh, and uh, let's say I pick up a phone. Actually, I remember I, I found an iPhone once in a park. I was trying to let that person know. I said, like, okay, let me call maybe a contact. Uh, so, you know, they can inform that person, <laughs> but I couldn't, I could never unlock it. And I, I remember actually the, what well, was a kind of a sad story, but, uh, you know, many years ago, there was a, uh, a shooting in San Bernardino and the FBI was trying to unlock the iPhone of, of the shooter and they couldn't do it, right? So even if the FBI cannot unlock an iPhone, uh, I'm pretty sure like it's, it's pretty secure. Uh, so... Yeah, it's very, very secure. And a lot of wallets will also add other type of uh, security features, such as entering, you know, 
uh, a pin number or you know your fingerprints or even facial recognition uh, you know especially like alipay for example you can just show your face and just confirm the payment uh, so so that's also additional features uh, it, it's very 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 safe compared to a card payment it's like there's no no difference yeah it's it's too extreme. Okay. <laughs> Great. And and then on the fraud side for the merchants, what has been the experience with uh, QR codes um, versus uh, card payments? Do you, do we have any statistics on that? I know that's pretty yeah. hard to come by, but yeah, no, we we actually did uh, we did run some statistics on, on our own uh, uh, merchants, right? So we've got uh, about like fifteen thousand merchants. Uh, it was quite a few millions of transactions, so it, it's uh, good data to look at. Uh, so we actually identify, uh, identified about, I think it was like six MCC codes that uh, had some, not even like fraud actually, but uh, what, what we call investigations, right? Where maybe the, the, the wallet was thinking, hey, is, that, is there a fraud or something? Uh, so it was, and I think the number, if we combine these numbers, I think it was like about 0.0002. I forgot if I forgot a zero or not, but anyway, it was really, really low um, uh, type of um, kind of investigation. Now on the merchant side, uh, there is no, I mean, not much they, they can fraud uh, outside of maybe using their, I don't know, uh, for cross-border, right? You can think about tr people trying to do some AML you know, trying to launder money uh, that they have in China, for example, via a company in the US. Uh, this is actually really hard to do and th this is caught right away. So there, uh, not only we have, uh, you know, systems to flag that, but the wallets also would have that. So it's really, really hard to fraud. Uh, and then when it comes to chargebacks, uh, I remember for a union pay QR code, for example, in 2020, there was one dispute. Now, among all the transaction, the whole year, there was one dispute that didn't even end up being a chargeback. It was simply the, the merchant uh, charged, uh, you know, $110 instead of $100. Uh, and it was just a fat finger issue. And they just simply needed to refund the, the, the $10 that charge extra. Uh, so that was not even a chargeback. Uh, WeChat and Alipay actually uh, don't support chargebacks, right? So you can, as a customer, you can still dispute a transaction, but the merchant keeps the, the decision basically. So they're not hanging on the decision from an issuing bank who doesn't care about the merchant. They can actually take care of this and, and decide uh, that like in re verticals like retail, QSR, you know, just like those very standard verticals that never happens. Uh, it's very, very, uh, very safe. I, I don't think I've ever seen actually uh, a dispute or even a request for, for reimbursement on, on these. Uh, that can happen a little bit more maybe on e-commerce, you know, when people don't receive the, the, the goods, uh, but it gives, you know, the power to the merchant. Then you go to other wallets, such as Venmo PayPal, where they have their own rules with, uh, you know, the, the customer fraud and uh, consumer fraud and the, the merchant fraud. So those are also different rules. So each wallet really makes their own rules. But overall, yeah, the number of chargeback is tremendously lower than uh, any other card transaction. All right. Thank you. I think that's it for questions. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. If you do have further questions, please feel free to uh, leave them and we will email back. Or um, if you're watching online and you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to as well uh, leave your comments in the post underneath and uh, follow us and uh, we will get back to you there too. So thank you very much.